Amen. Let's all be seated this morning. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about how we want this year to be a different year and how we have been endeavoring to train ourselves. We began with talking about the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and how that's going to affect us. And we need first to understand that everything I'm going to talk about this morning comes as a byproduct of our communion with Christ, and it comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace empowers us, and understand that. But this morning I want to talk about try versus train. Everybody get the, the Yoda? Do or do not. There is no try. Now the reason I wanted to, to make that clear is because we need to understand some certain things. Let's look at these three verses before I get started. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. But have nothing to do with worldly fables or old wives' tales. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline or exercise or training is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds the promise of for the present life and the life to come. 1 Corinthians 9.24. And where did that go? There we go. Do not all those... Sorry. Do you not know that those who run in a race, all, but only one receives the prize, run in such a way that you receive the prize? Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. And Luke 640, and this is a significant one to understand because this is what you, this is, these are the words of Jesus. He says, a pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians that to make our bodies a slave. I want you to understand something. Our bodies are a very, very good slave. If we bring our bodies into submission, into obedience to the will of God, in obedience to the word of God, it makes a great slave. But I want you to know something. It makes a very, very terrible master. Uh, it's one of the things that destroys human beings, endeavoring to allow their body to dictate what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, whether it's alcohol, drugs, sex, food, it doesn't matter. It makes a lousy master. And so we need to understand that Paul said that if we're going to be successful, we need to train our bodies, discipline our bodies. Now, the word discipline has a bad thing. We think of spanking our kid, you know, I'm going to discipline you. But it's a little bit like that. Sometimes you've got to spank the body, for lack of a better term, to bring it into control. You've got to deny, deny it some things so that it'll come into the right place. Now, is there anybody in the room that thinks right now they could run out, and I'm going to say run, run today a marathon? Anybody? 26 miles, you could run the whole thing. 26. No, <laughs> Bill, no. How about, how about a 5K? How many of you think you could run a 5K? Just one? Maybe two? How many of you think you could, if you really tried hard, gave all your effort, you could run a 5K? <laughs> Maybe, a few of you. All right. But the rest of us, it's just not going to happen. Now, 
I, I was going to originally say marathon, but it's not necessary to use marathon because all of us are not in very good shape. So how many of you think you, I believe that every person in the room could run a 5K. I believe it. I believe you can run a 5K. But something would have to take place in order for you to do that. You would have to train. And I have to tell you something. I've been trying to get in better shape, and I, I, I'm not very successful at it yet, but we're working on it. But I, that, that's the word try. So you don't ever want to use that word. I try. Because I'll tell you how far I got. I went online because I was going to run a 5K. I bought a treadmill and everything. So I went online, looked up couch to 5K. Downloaded on my last phone, downloaded on my last phone and said, this is what it takes to do. You get on the treadmill and you, whatever it says, you run for the, it's the first time you run for four minutes. And then wind down and do that. But it claims that it can get you from the couch to a 5K, and I think it's 31 days. Maybe, maybe a little more. I think it's five weeks, six weeks. Huh? <laughs> and so, so you follow their directions, and they say you can run a 5K within a couple of months. Because, but you have to train. Now, I tell you, I did really good. I downloaded it. Good intentions will not get me to run a 5K. I don't even know. My daughter said, well, if somebody's got a gun at me, I might be able to do it. I don't even know if I could do a 5K with a gun chasing me. It doesn't matter. I'm going to die by the bullet or die by passing out, you know, one or the other. I don't think I could do it. But I do believe that I can train to do it. I do believe that I can train myself by proper diet, uh, exercise, bring myself up to that place slowly. You know, right now, two laps are on the block, and I'm probably ready for bed. But that's not what will happen if we train ourselves. I tend to... I like to go to the gym if I, if I pick a habit, that's the one I do. And at this point in my life, when I was about, when I was young, I guess my wife met me, so somewhere between 18 and 20, I could bench press 385 pounds. I, I had a, a 45 inch chest, a 29 inch waist. I could run five miles. If I went into the gym right now, and said, I, I, I could bench press 385 pounds before. And I attempted to bench press 385 pounds. They better have an EMT close by because I would probably crack a few ribs when I dropped it on my chest. And I would probably never get it off. Even to save my life, I doubt I would be able to push that off. But I have to tell you, when I was 16 years old, I didn't start out doing it that either. I started out with 40 pounds or 50 pounds for um, wrestling. I wanted to wrestle in high school. And so I started the weights. I got to the point where I could bench press about 120 pounds or 150 pounds with, um, in a bridge so that I, could nev I wouldn't lose a wrestling match, at least not be buying pinned. I, I'd sit there like this. The guy jumping up and down on me, and I'd be giggling um, because I didn't want to lose. At least not, I didn't want to be pinned. I lost most of them, but I didn't want to get pinned. But I trained myself to get to that place. And when you and I think about it, we think about training for a marathon, training for a 5K, training for a gym, training to play soccer, training to do... That just makes sense. You have to train to be good at it. You train to play the piano. But when we look at things that say, train yourself, discipline yourself, therefore, unto godliness, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual to us. We'll just keep trying. 
trying is not going to happen. How many of you tried to be more, uh, I don't know, uh, anything, Ch tried to be more loving last year, more giving, more gracious, more, you tried, and maybe it worked a little bit, but you've been trying to do that every year for the last 25 years. Well, because we need to understand that trying isn't sufficient. See, what we need to do is train. And the reason we train is training, by definition, is I arrange my life in such a way with, in, and perform such practices that it enables me to do that which I cannot do by effort alone. If I was going to bring a, a dumbbell up here, a barbell up here, but I couldn't find anybody that works out. <laughs> About 150 pounds. And I was going to have Mandy come up here. I was going to have Mandy come up here and, and li lift up that 150 pounds. And if she lifted it, it would have killed my illustration. But right, that's, that's effort, sheer will. But since she weighs more than 150, getting it up over her head is unlikely. And I think I could still do that, so I would say. But the difference is she can try, and she can try harder. And we could tell her, try harder! And, and it's just not going to happen. You're not trying hard enough. You're just not trying. And see, that's what we think about things when we try to add spiritual life. Well, really, I want to quit smoking. Well, try harder. Well, so how many people know you can't necessarily try any harder than you're already trying? Because trying is not enough. Effort is not enough. Very few people can do things like that for, by sheer will alone. Some of us can. Some of us can't. And, and so we need to understand that it's, be, it's more than that. We need to arrange our life around such practices that enable us to do that which we cannot do by trying alone. Now, that sounds a little bit like work, but if you want something to get done, it gets done. We run a music studio, and there's this little girl, Olivia. <laughs> and Olivia is uh, 11 now, 14. She started at 7. And... and she is magnificent, prolific at how well she plays, how proficient she plays. And she gets up here on the piano, and I have to tell you, basically she all but gets a standing ovation when she gets done playing. So this time, everyone said, yeah, you did great. So I, I am the, the, I don't know what it is. It's just I always get to teach, so I guess that's what it is. So I looked up and said, Olivia, that's wonderful. You did great. How much do you practice? She goes, my parents tell me I don't have a life. I'm always in my room. They have to tell me to get out. Well, that's what they used to say about Pastor Gail. Her sisters and brothers all say they can't play the piano because Gail would never get off it. <laughs> get another piano. But understand, and that's what has to happen. Paul tells us, I want to, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I want you to understand something. Be ye transformed. Do you think that has, that phrase has great significance? Do you know what it says? It doesn't tell you to transform yourself, does it? Be ye transformed. That's right. So something else is going to transform you. Something's going to change you from the inside out. Transformation involves training. And that's not just true about the natural. If I want to get back to where I have a 45-inch chest or 29-inch waist and, you know, 17-inch biceps, which I don't know if I ever had, but you get the point. I have to train to do it. It's just, I'm just not going to go. And you know what? You know what's sad about our nation? And it comes, it's going to bring it into the church too. But you know why it's sad in our nation? We now have ads on television that say, put this on. Strap it to your chest, program it a little bit, and it will electronically stimulate your muscles so that you get stronger and bigger. Do you know those companies are being sued? Because it just doesn't work. But do you know what the funny thing about it is? People buy them. 
Why? Because they want the transformation without the training. They want the best without any effort whatsoever. And we want to think that in our spiritual life, all we're going to do is try and God will give us the best. It's not about trying. Paul doesn't say be transformed by trying. He doesn't say discipline, try yourself unto godliness. He doesn't say that. He says train yourself unto godliness. And that's a hard concept. How do we train to be godly? How do we train to do those things? The purpose of training or discipline is to receive power, whether it's running and you train yourself to run, have the power, the strength, the ability to go a 5K, lift weights, you train yourself, you empower, you build your muscles so that you can lift 150 pounds. It's a training. And it, the discipline in our spiritual life, the disciplines that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks are to give us Power from on high, because God will not give you power if you are not prepared for the power. He doesn't, you have a, a good example, Nathan, is he still here? He's not. He doesn't feel well. Oh, um, Nathan was two and a half years old, no, 18 months old, and Nathan always wanted to drive. So his mom's, I don't know, in the kitchen. And Nathan sneaks out the back door. Now, 18 months old, he picks up the garage door, climbs onto the lawnmower, and gets it going down the hill. Oh, it wasn't running? Okay. <laughs> okay, I didn't know he didn't get it started. But as much as he wanted to do this, he got up there. Now his mother looks out the window and goes, oh, my God. Now she's running around the driveway trying to catch the moving lawnmower heading toward the road. Great desire. But when you put a 1,200-pound vehicle in the hands of a 26-pound 18-month-old, you have a recipe for disaster. But it's the same context in God. God will not endue you with power from on high to do great and mighty things until you have humbled yourself, until you have prayed through, until you have had the victory over the enemy time and time again. Because as Spider-Man learned, with great power, bunch of geeks. I'm going to talk you saw Yoda up there. <laughs> Too often, we leave here on Sunday morning thinking we need to try harder. But growing in Christ is not mere effort. It's not enough to try harder. Just like it's not enough to try harder to run a marathon, it's not enough to try harder to be more spiritual. A disciplined person is not someone who necessarily does a lot of disciplines. Uh-oh. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to blow that right out of the water. I pray every day. As a matter of fact, I was reading, I don't even know who Ignatius is. Okay. <laughs> he was a, uh, a founding father of the faith, Catholicism, but a very devout. He prayed and prayed and prayed. So I read about a guy who began to, uh, with this Ignatius prayer group, and they're trying to rush me along. I'm not even on page one yet. And this Ignatius prayer group. And he came in and he said, I have prayed for 31 days consecutively for one whole hour. Anybody want to guess what the leader of the prayer group told him to do? Nope. Don't pray tomorrow. Why would she tell him not to pray tomorrow? Because pride's coming in. See, you need to develop those things. It's not about 
the disciplines. I read, I pray every day, I do acts of service every single day. It's disciplined life is not one that necessarily does a lot of disciplines. But listen to the definition as far as I'm concerned. The, discipline, uh, the definition of a disciplined life is that you do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. You have the power to get it accomplished and you do it in the right spirit. Uh-oh. You have the power to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done with the right attitude. I know a lot of people that have the power that they do it, but man, can they complain? That's not a disciplined life. And that's really not the way God wants it to happen. How many of you ever... How many of you journal? One person, two people. I, until I read this recent one, I thought it was hilarious. I always felt bad that I don't journal or don't journal enough. I don't do journal, period, so that's really not enough. But um, there are people that talk about it, journaling as a spiritual discipline that will change your life forever. And now you feel bad about not journaling. I don't journal. And so I was reading uh, Dallas Willard, and his comment was this. Moses didn't journal. Peter didn't journal. You don't see Paul running down to the local staples and getting his journal. He didn't journal. I don't know. It all makes sense. Now, if you do journal... And journaling helps you grow spiritually. It helps you keep on track for the Lord. Journal your brains out. But those of you who don't journal and felt guilty that they didn't journal, forget about it. Why would I say that? Because it's not a necessary discipline in our lives. It's not a bad one. It's a good habit if you do it. Well, what are you saying? I got, what I'm saying is you have much more things and bigger things in your life to feel guilty about than not journaling. And why am I saying that? Because it's not about the disciplines. It's about having the right attitude at the right time. We need to understand that things change in our lives. Bonhoeffer said this way, the cost of discipleship, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he says, discipleship is simply the receiving of grace. Now, I want to talk about that for just a moment, because I think I'm going to talk about that next week. But real simply, we're great at telling people they need grace, right? We are saved by grace through faith. That's it. We're really great at telling people that. But we're not so good in the church about teaching people how to live by the power of grace. Grace has power? Well, Paul says, be strong in grace. Peter tells us to grow in grace. Grace is much more than mm, unmerited favor. You sin, he's okay. It's more than that. It's the power to empower us. I'm sorry, it's the power to enable us to be successful in our Christian walk. Here, Paul is telling Timothy to train. When I hear the word train, if I'm not thinking of a little car that goes, the first thing I think of is Effort, energy, discipline, dedication, hard work, right? If you want to be healthy, unless you are one of those blessed few individuals, it takes energy, effort, and hard work. You ever meet one of those people who say, I do anything I want, this is what I look like, and, you know, skinny as a rail and whatever, can't get. The first thing I want to do is choke them. Although I used to be that person, I'm not anymore. Because it's not that easy. It's hard. It takes effort. Now, I, I want you to understand something. 
in terms of if you want to be a weightlifter or a runner, that might not be for everyone. It might, it doesn't come naturally. But when it comes to our spiritual life, it's not like some of us can opt out of the training process. If we want to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must, and I like this word, you need to train ourselves to be godly. I know that doesn't sound spiritual, but even Jesus said, if you want to be like me, when you are fully trained, you will be. So how do we train ourselves? How do we train ourselves to be godly? Uh, yourself. Well, let's go with this one first. Yourself. You can't expect others to do it for you. You're personally responsible. My daughter Ashley goes to the gym three times a week. She's in very good shape, healthy. Um, I can't say Ashley goes for me. That's great. It doesn't help me at all. I can't run three miles like she can. I, I don't have the waist she has. I, I have an appetite that is off the scales when it comes to hers. I don't have the discipline it takes to go three times a week right now. I think it's important. I think I should take care of my body. But I obviously don't think it's important enough to go to the gym. Heck, I don't think it's important enough to get off the couch and walk over to the treadmill. And let me be perfectly honest, it's about this far. As a matter of fact, if I really wanted to be energetic, I could just flip over the couch that's right behind it, and I'd be on the treadmill. All you're going to do is get started. doesn't happen. I look at it. Actually, I'm thinking of getting rid of it because it's just an eyesore. Now, when I got the treadmill, I want you to understand something. I tried. I really, really tried. I got on there. I went down every day. Now, the first thing I did, I put it on, and I realized that I cannot walk eight miles an hour, no matter how hard I tried. So I put it on a small incline and three miles an hour. And I did it, and I never do anything small. I don't. So I, I did it. I, I put the headband on. I, I put um, ankle weights on, a couple of dumbbells in my hand. Because I'm going to get all, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get everything I can out of it. <laughs> and they, they look at me. They go, Dad, you're going to die. Sweat pouring off my face. I'm gonna <laughs> so I did that for 20 minutes the first day. I felt great. I did it for 20 minutes the second day. I did it for 21 I did it for three weeks. I was up to 38 minutes. Life got busy. That was the end of the treadmill. I obviously, I tried. I really tried. However, I want you to know that three weeks of trying did not accomplish anything. Because it took all of five days for just to go back to the regular stuff, eat the same stuff, do the same stuff, because life got busy. So obviously, it was not that important to me. But in the same context, that's how it works in the Word of God. That we can try ourselves, Ashley going, somebody else going, thinking about doing it, will not make it. I, all the great, like I said, I put, why, I'm sorry, couch to 5K, still on my old phone. Doesn't do me any good. I got to tell you, really, if you really want to think about it, I didn't even transfer it to the new one. <laughs> you know, I just didn't. And it says, then it goes to B. And I want you to understand, this is what I'm talking about. It's not about talking. It's not about pretending. It's not about good intentions. It's not about the plan to do it. I bought the treadmill. I'm planning to get it. It's not about trying to exercise or trying to do better or trying to be more spiritual because it will not work. Now, okay, discipline yourself, therefore, under godliness. What does that mean, godliness? Well, godlike. It means we be consistent to what we know about God, to be God-pleasing. How do we train ourselves to be godly? What kind of exercises do we do? And I listed ten but you can come up with a h thousands of things you can come up with. But let me give you some examples. I, as I was reading the book, I realized that probably my greatest weakness, I, I don't know what you call it a sin, but weakness, my greatest inhibitor to being the person God's called me to do is I, um, I have a hurried life. Now, Dallas Willard 
in one of the most profound comments I'd ever heard, said, if you want to be spiritual, basically, he said, with reckless abandonment, purge out hurriedness from your life. Now, he said, that doesn't mean don't be busy. Be as busy as you want. Get rid of hurriedness. Now, what's hurriedness? What's the sickness or disease of hurriedness? Well, in my case, I thought, and, and when I heard this, I, Pastor Gail would always say, it must be horrible to me, me, because my mind never stops. I'm driving on the road. I think of every scenario that could happen. I think about what I might do, what I'm going to do when I go home, what I'm going to do with my money, how I'm going to spend it, what I'm going to do if I don't get enough money, what I'm going to do if I have too much money, how I'm going to come up with my offering, what's going to happen here. What's, my mind is flying all over the place going through a hundred things. Sometimes you can be talking to me and I can I don't even hear what you're saying because I'm looking right at you trying to be as attentive as I possibly can and I'm thinking about, gee, I forgot to put the food on the table. <laughs> it's true. I have to say, excuse me, what did you say? I didn't hear that. And I'm looking right at them, being attentive because I'm, I, I'm such a hurried life. And he said, with reckless abandonment, do work as hard as you can to get rid of hurriedness. And I, I'm trying to do that now because the truth is, I was we come I come on su Sunday Saturday and Sunday morning and we pray here at the church. And I would kneel down to pray, and I would literally for the first ten or fifteen minutes, I'm doing nothing but fighting out other thoughts. What I got to do at 10, 9 o'clock when I'm done? Where am, am I going to go grocery shopping? Do I have to stop at the studio? I run, have to run to the bank because if I don't make the bank before such and such a time, I might not have enough money to cover the stuff to come. And my mind goes, and it takes me 15 minutes. Pastor Gay goes, you poor thing. I sit down, close my eyes, I'm, that's God. Now that's where we need to get. But I live that hurried life. So I didn't realize that that, that was a hurried life. I thought it was a blessing from God. That I would always be prepared for anything that came my way. I think up scenarios of things that could never happen. But if they do happen, I'm ready. And, and I use Pastor Gail because we talk a lot driving in the car. And the first thing she said was, you think about things that never happen. But if they do, I'm ready. I know what to say to the person when they say the wrong thing to me. I know this. That's great. But how much time do you waste thinking about stuff that never happens? preparing for stuff that never happens. And so I began to try to change it, and I will tell you, it's changed a great deal in the last 21 days, or whatever you are. We'll get to 21 shortly. It's changed. I don't have that much of a problem. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't think you have the hurried life, let me give you some symptoms of the hurried life, because this is one that God had to deal with me. Have you ever drove up to a stoplight? And there's two lanes. And when you look at, when you're coming up to the stoplight, you look at the car, the make the model, and you look at the driver because you want to know which one's going to pull out first. That's the next one, right? You want to pull out, you want to see which one's going to pull out first. And I was guilty of that for years, I will admit it. I realized that life isn't worth it, that 15 seconds. And so I really don't do that. But I did it. You would look up, and I'd look to see which car. But you know what's worse? I can tell you, you're really a victim of the hurried life when you get behind one, and the other guy zips up faster, and you're mad. See, people laughing because they know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> the other one, I do the grocery shopping. Do you ever look at a grocery line? And you kind of walk, you kind of, now I don't do this, but I did. I have learned, and I learned for the wrong reason, but I had to practice it. I had to tell you. I had to practice it. And I would drive, go down the grocery aisle and look to see what, look to see if the teller, if the, the cashier looks competent. You know, you want, a comp, you want someone that's just competent, not the lady that's going, aren't you the cutest little thing? So I would look for that. And then here's the other thing that you know you're a victim of it when you get in line and you've already checked the other four per people that got in line at the same time as you. And if they get out ahead of you, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe you're about ready to lose your salvation over it. You're all laughing because you know. 
I have learned not to do that. I got to tell you, I don't know how it came to being. I just began to change it. Something God said to me was okay. And I became, because I cared about that cashier, because I would drive up to, the, I would get up there, unload everything, and the first thing they would say if it's busy, I'm sorry it took so long. And my response would be, after all these people are mean, all, after, after all these people are being mean to them, my response would be, don't worry about it. Life is short. You know, what, what, what difference is 10 minutes going to make? And they would go, oh, thank you. But there was a time in my life where I would be like, oh, hmm. And ask it. My, my girls go shopping with me. They've seen it. What's going on? But I don't do that anymore. But I want to tell you why I'm telling you this. Because how did you become less hurried in that area? Now, I have to find a way to train my mind. I haven't figured that one out yet. But what I did was I got in the longest line I could, and thank God for being in line, and tried to develop patience. The first few times, it was like, But God's got a purpose. And that four or five minutes is not going to change it. I used to speed. I, I try not to speed. Um, I do, I, but I used to speed until I realized that in Rhode Island, speeding is nothing but a safety hazard. Do you know that? Rhode Island's only 60 miles long. You would have to drive 200 miles an hour to make any time. If you're so important that being one minute earlier is going to make a difference in your life, glory to God, I want to know you. Because that's all you're going to save. If you drive 10 miles over the speed limit, 75 miles an hour, cruise 30 miles to work, do you know how much time you've saved? 45 seconds. Are you really that important? So I learned not to do that. But I haven't learned how to stop it in my mind yet. And I'm working on it. And I'm hoping and believing God that he's going to do it. But you need to practice that. Let me give you another one. In my own life, those of you who have known me a very long time, I would never say I was lazy. I have to get moving. I didn't realize it was this late. <laughs> yeah. I know. I learned to do this, okay? I learned that I wasn't a very servant-motivated person. I wasn't. I would, if you asked me to do something, I would grudgingly get up and do it. If you didn't ask, I wouldn't care how much you were struggling. And some, my wife would say, well, why don't you help them? Get up and help them. I'm going, if they wanted help, they would ask. Makes sense, right? Let them ask. I'll be more than happy to help anybody. And I don't know when it happened, but I read a verse that said, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, become the servant of all. Um, if you want to be great. If you want to be great in God's kingdom. If you want to be the person God's called you to be, that's what greatness is, fulfilling your calling and destiny. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, become the servant of all. Yuck. But I began to say, I'd see a need. And I would say, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, be a servant of all. Can I help? Uh, initially, it was not an easy thing. Initially, it was, okay. And sometimes I would walk away. How can they be so stupid as to not put a spare tire in their car? What kind of planning was that? You know, I would go... Not in front of them. I'd smile and do the right thing. But the spirit hadn't come there yet. But somewhere in the process of just obeying the word, somewhere in the process of being a servant, it became part of who I am. And I serve. I see a need. I get up and do it. As a matter of fact, the first thing I do is do you know, I went out, we come in, we, I see shoveling, and what wasn't done good enough, I went out and did it. I, I, I didn't wait for someone else to show up, or this didn't happen, I just went out and did it. And somewhere in my life, in my walk with the Lord, that changed. And I mean, I was bad. I used to call my younger brother up at 10, 11 o'clock at night and tell him, bring me a pizza. People say, you're kidding. You know, so he could say no. He always brought me a pizza. I thought it was nice. They said, you know, that's kind of, what word did they use? 
<laughs> rude or whatever word. He just said, really? I never thought of it. Now, I'm going to give you this list. These lists are things that we can do, ex- ways we can exercise our godliness. But I want you to understand, this list is insufficient completely. Because if you read Dallas Willard, he'll give you 15 spiritual disciplines you need to add in your life. If you read um, Richard Forster, he's got 10. So that's 25. I came up with 10. That's 35. So it's not about the discipline. But I'm going to tell you how you know what to do. Start backwards. What? Let's say we do a little self-examination and see where you are. Not, well, pastor says I should seek, strive, look, witness, watch, grow, follow, pray, labor, and obey. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, well, I'm going to just start doing it. I'm going to seek God more. I'm going to strive more. I'm going to look more. I'm going to witness more. I'm going to watch for his presence more. I'm going to grow in grace. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to pray a whole hour a day. I'm going to labor for the Lord. I'm going to be obedient to whatever he tells me to do. <laughs> First off, you're going to kill yourself. And second off, you know what? They may not help your problem at all. So what I mean when I say stay, start backwards, take a moment and evaluate your life. What are you having problems with? Well, I really have a hard time with service. I'm a little bit selfish. Me, 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 me. Now, you know what? Some selfish people don't know they're selfish. But the majority of them know, especially if you're a believer. If the first thing comes to your mind is, pastor's preaching long, what well, does that affect me? Not somebody could be blessed, somebody's filled, strengthened, encouraged. Um, none of those things you think, how does it affect me? Now I'm going to tell you, if you're selfish, then what you need to do is to make a conscious effort to train yourself to be giving and to consider others first. What does that mean? Well, so-and-so gave me a call for a ride to church in the morning. And you know what? It's already hard for me to come to church. It kills me just to be almost on time. Getting up another half hour early? I just couldn't do that. Yes, you can. And that's what you decide to do. Now, I understand sometimes some people that are like that used to drive me crazy. They would call me. People would call me for a ride to church. I go, that's great. I'm already here. I don't know how I can help you. If you called me last night, I'd be happy to do it. Um, Used to be. (laughs) How many remember Matt? Matt was a great guy, but he had a lot of things. He said, Pastor Jim, can you pick me up on your way? I said, well, I go to church really early. He goes, that's all right. I'll practice my guitar. I'll set up the sound. I'll do all this stuff. But I would show up where he was living, and he would be asleep. So his re- Now, listen to me. It's a little bit of effort, but I'm going to tell you. Do you know what his response to that was? I'm sorry, Pastor. I'll be right down. His way to alleviate that was give me a key. Come in and wake me up. And I did. That's a little enabling, but I did. I said, I drove all the way there. You're going to come down. <laughs> it's just that simple. But the idea was, it was never easy for me, but you want to learn to serve. You consider others, and you put others before yourself. If that's what, you're str- that's what you need to look at. If you're having a tr- uh, problem with anger, then you need to find out what makes you angry and then do something that makes you angry with a good attitude so that you can all that it changes. And so you need to take, now look, some of you, when I suggest you do stuff like this, people go, the list is too big. I got a lot of problems. Too many things going on. Okay, I'm going to tell you, and if you want to answer that, listen to what I'm about to tell you because this will do it. If you take that moment and you begin to look backwards, and you begin to train, want to train yourself to be, and you're really not sure what to do. You sit down and say, what do I struggle with? What do I have problems with? What, 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 what gets me going? What makes me angry? What do I get? 
depressed, discouraged, ticked off about what happened, what does that to me? And the list just gets huge. Then you need to say, okay, God, what's the first one I need to work on? And he'll tell you. And I got some very, very good news for you. If you take the first one, the one that God says is the one, the biggest problem in your life, and you train yourself to have a godly attitude about that situation, number one, it'll change your life. But I got some very, very good news for you. If you take the first one, and it has to be the one that God tells you, and oftentimes it's not the one that you think it is, but if you do the one that God tells you, a lot of the other ones fall in line. Because that's the foundation. That's the kingpin. That's the first one. Like, God tells you to be more selfless. And you don't think you're very selfish at all. But you begin to discipline your life, train yourself to be selfless. Number one, it'll become who you are. Number two, a whole lot of other things just go away. Because it's the foundation of all of them. Unhappiness, uh, discontent, covetousness, all that stuff falls by the wayside when you simply get rid of selfish by being selfless. And so God is wonderful. So now listen, I want to close. Let me just do a song. I don't need a song, just a song for worship. Because I don't know how you can discipline yourself, you know. But I want this year to be different. And I'm going to tell you something right here and right now. Look at me, everybody. Look at me. This will not be a different or a better year if you try harder. I guarantee you, if you train harder, you'll have a better year. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. And so what I want you to do is to start backwards. Just in your own quiet time, sit before the presence of the Lord and simply say, what areas do I need to work in? Do I need to seek, strive, look, witness, watch, grow, follow, pray, labor, intercede? I mean, the list is huge. The list is huge. And, and the purpose isn't just to do these ten things. The purpose is because now you're just saying, I do all those and I'm not any better. The purpose is for you to come to a place where you have a closer, more intimate relationship with God. And the principle in Scripture is God's evidence is always first the natural, then the spiritual. If we have to train in the natural to be successful, we need to train. We need to discipline ourselves in the spiritual. If you have trouble with gossip, practice silence. If you have a trouble with complaining, say nice things to people all the time, even if you don't mean it. Isn't that lying? No. It's training yourself. It's training to watch your mouth. I want this year to be different for the church. I want this year to, year to be different for every person sitting here and every person that's not sitting here this morning. And the way it will happen is if you and I make a determination in our heart that today, this, this year is going to be different than every other year, and we are going to train ourselves on the godliness. Not just add a bunch of disciplines in our life, but train ourselves to be godly. Amen? Let's pray and we can all stand and do it ourselves. Lord, we just ask right now as we take this opportunity to understand that trying harder is not going to work. Lord, I ask that you speak to every heart and every life this morning. Everyone that's here, everyone that might hear this message later, Lord, that speak to their hearts as they do that moment of self-examination where to start. And Lord, give them creative means to discipline themselves to godliness. It's not just about reading or praying or singing or worshiping more. It's about adding to your life 
patience, from your patience, godliness, virtues, adding upon adding. And Lord, we just ask right now, in the name of Jesus, that you speak to every life where to begin. And Lord, that you give each and every one a means to get it accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. We are dismissed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's break through. Break through.